Are all antarrhythmic drugs the same? Absolutely not. Today, I'm going to walk you through the full spectrum of antiarrhythmic medications used to manage atrial fibrillation from the mildest to the most powerful. We'll cover which drugs are best for which types of atrial fibrillation, when they work, when they don't work, and what risks come with each option. This is the video your doctor probably didn't have time to explain, but could make all the difference in your outcome. So let's start with the basics. Antrimuth drugs, or AADs, are categorized by strength and effectiveness. The stronger the drug, the more likely it is to control atrial fibrillation, but also the greater the risks of serious side effects. The right drug depends on how long you've had AFib, the condition of your heart, and your other medical problems. So let's break this down from weakest to strongest. First up, the weakest class, used for paroxysmal early atrial fibrillation, which means episodes that last less than seven days. So, fleconide. The brand name is Tambacord, which is a class 1C sodium channel blocker. It slows conduction in the atrium, best for people with structurally normal hearts. It works well in early stage atrial fibrillation, but not safe if you've had a heart attack, underlying heart blockages, a weak heart, or have severe valve disease. It's often used in combination with a beta blocker or a calcium channel blocker to prevent dangerous atrial flutter conduction. Number two, propafenone or Rhythmol, which is the brand name. This is also a sodium channel blocker, but with mild beta blocking properties. It's similar in strength to fleconide, but slightly weaker for some patients. Again, needs to be avoided in structural heart disease. So next step up, Dronetero, or brand name, Maltac. It's a multi-channel blocker with anti-adrenergic effects. It's safer long-term than its counterpart, amiodarone, but not as strong. So when they made Maltac, what they did was they used amiodarone, which is the strongest drug we have to suppress atrial fibrillation, but had long-term toxic side effects, and they hoped they just changed the chemical structure a little bit, that they would get something just as strong, but without any of the toxic long-term side effects. What they ended up getting was something without the toxic long-term side effects, but much, much, much weaker. So this drug is best used for patients with paroxysmal or early persistent atrial fibrillation, but don't use it if you have severe heart failure. Now let's talk about drugs that are moderate strength, used for persistent atrial fibrillation, defined as episodes lasting over seven days, or long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, such as sotalol or betapase, which is the brand name. This is a potassium channel blocker with beta blocking effects. It's useful when you need both rhythm and rate control, but it can prolong the QT interval which means a risk of a dangerous rhythm called torsades de poids, a dangerous rhythm, a dangerous abnormal rhythm. You'll need ECG monitoring when starting this. The next strongest drug, the second strongest drug, dofetilide, or ticacin, which is its brand name. This is a pure potassium channel blocker. It's one of the strongest rhythm drugs outside of the strongest amiodarone. It's very effective, but unlike fleconide or sotolol, it's safe in heart failure or people with structural heart disease, but it must be started in the hospital for at least three days to monitor the heart rhythm with an EKG due to risk of potentially dangerous rhythm side effects. And finally, let's talk about the nuclear option, amiodarone. Brand names are cordarone, pacerone. This blocks sodium, potassium, and calcium channels. It has beta blocking effects, so it can slow your heart rate and lower your blood pressure. It's the most effective antiarrhythmic drug, especially for later stage persistent and long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation. But it comes at a cost. It can cause lung toxicity, liver damage, thyroid dysfunction, eye problems. This is why we only use amiodarone when absolutely necessary or in short-term treatment before a cardioversion or an ablation. It's the last resort, but for some, it's the only thing that works. Now, talking about the side effects, long-term side effects are potentially very concerning, but they don't happen right away. So usually at the current doses of this drug that we use, you have to be on it for at least five to seven years, and then there's a 30% chance of developing those dangerous side effects of damage to the liver, lungs, eyes, and thyroid. 
So personally, this is why I never use this drug for long-term atrial fibrillation suppression if the patient's under age 75 years old. And I try to work my way up to it using the other androgen drugs first. And unless they fail, then go to ADR. So what's the right drug for you? Well, for early stage paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, I tend to use flecainide or propafenone or Moltec, Dronetera, if you have a structurally normal heart. Sotalol or dofetilide is usually used if you need beta blocking properties or have a structural heart problem or weak heart. For persistent atrial fibrillation, sotalol and dofetilide are the preferred agents because the weaker drugs probably won't be strong enough. In the other, I use only if the others fail or if you have serious underlying disease or structural heart problems or a weak heart. For long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, which is the later stage, again, I use sotalol and dofetilide because they work very well. Amiodarone is used when others don't work. And if you have heart failure symptoms, I would stick to amiodarone or dofetilide. I would avoid flecainide, propafenone, and dronetarone. So here's the bottom line. Flecainide and propafenone are great for early stage atrial fibrillation if your heart is structurally normal. Dronetarone is safer, but weaker. Sotalol and dofetilide are solid options for more advanced atrial fibrillation stages. Amiodarone is powerful, but used with extreme caution. And if drugs don't work or stop working, catheter ablation is often the best next step. Thanks for watching. If this helped clarify your options, please like us or subscribe or share it with somebody living with atrial fibrillation. I'll see you in the next video. For everything atrial fibrillation related, please feel free to go to my website, drscottlee.com, where you're gonna find more resources and also can follow me on social media.